Welcome back to Retro Rebound. In today's video, we are celebrating the Blue Blur's big day. Oh, I just hit myself in the eye. Whoa, did you see that? Whoa, there he goes again. Wow, he's so fast. Was that, could that be Shadow the Hedgehog? No, it's Maddie the Rebound Hog, and he's wearing his brand new Vessies. Vessies are a fantastic everyday sneaker. Do you want to become a hedgehog? Guess what you got to do? Throw on a pair of Vessies and go through the Sonic Obstacle Course, stacking every single game you've played into a mountaintop. Vessies are also 100% waterproof, and I don't work with any single brand that I don't trust. So how much do I trust them? I submerged my foot in my own toilet here. And yes, after taking out a paper towel that I stuffed into my shoe, it came out completely dry. Vessies are officially my go-to shoe shoe by the door. And ladies and gentlemen, they're not done hooking you up yet with just cool footwear because they're going to take care of your socks. And if you're like me, you care about colorful, cool socks because the first 100 people to use my code and order themselves a pair of these bad boys using the code SOCKSRETRO will get themselves a free pair of socks. Now, let's say you've missed out on this. Then don't worry. There's still the early Black Friday sale. Head over to Vessi.com slash SOCKSRETRO. And over there, you can check out their early Black Friday sale to get yourself a cool pair of sneaks like these. Come on, look at the Sonic vibes. Shout out to Vessi for sponsoring today's video. Anyway, <laughs> today we are celebrating Sonic Frontiers. Why are we doing that? It's his big day. So we got the big stack of games. Why did I poke myself, man? Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, I have really been looking forward to Sonic Frontiers for a while as my vision returns now. I have been so excited for this game. I hope it's peak fiction, but more than anything, I just hope it feels good to play. It isn't an autopilot game. But nonetheless, we have so many different Sonic games to reflect on today in honor of the series legacy. So let's not delay any further. Ladies and gentlemen, if you are new here and you are into retrospective nostalgic content or maybe even Sonic content, because we've done a lot of that here, consider subscribing now. Let's begin with numero uno, Sonic Adventure 1. Now we don't have the GameCube version for Sonic Adventure 1 or 2. Hopefully you understand and I know that there were Sonic games before Adventure, but this is where my journey began, and I think many others, and also I've seen how Genesis games perform on here, like when we did the Batman ones, it doesn't work. So we're starting with Adventure, all right? Sonic Adventure Director's Cut on GameCube. We got it for 25 bucks here, you can see, which wasn't a bad price at all, but that was pre-pandemic. It's like 50 bucks now. Total Chaos, Sonic and friends return to the Nintendo GameCube in their greatest adventure of all time. Experience all the epic thrills with enhanced graphics, more action, and all new exclusive content. Cracking it open, the beautiful two-tone disc, love that. And this manual, on the surface, pleases me greatly. Why? We love a girthy manual here on Retro Rebound. This is thick and fat, and it has so much text in it, but what's that? Not a lot of color. It deserves better. So I don't know if you could ever remaster a manual, but hey, that's a great business idea. Someone can take it and trademark it. So as you can see here, you have a lot of character bios because this game actually focused on the story and made it a cast of characters worth caring about. You also see there's a lot of focus on controls because each character plays a little differently, even if they use the same set of buttons, like Sonic and Knuckles play a little bit differently compared to Tails and Gamma and so on and so forth. It also breaks down the starting of a game, which I always get a kick out of. Like, this, did nobody know how to start a game ever? I, I don't know. I, I managed to figure it out when I was three. But you see they get into things like the adventure field and emblems, chows, all this stuff. It's a very deep, rich game. Uh, deeper than I think you would expect when looking at it on the surface. The trial mode, the mission mode, which was added on GameCube and so on and so forth. And on the back here, we have a promotion of Sonic Adventure 2. Just that's player's choice, but we don't mess with that here. Well, actually, there is a copy here that's player's choice, but I didn't have a say in it. Anyway, let's talk about 
Sonic Adventure 1. This is the game that awoke the Sonic fan in me. Now, I had enjoyed Sonic games in the past. I liked, for example, Sonic Generations. I just thought it felt good to play. The story was pretty terrible, but I enjoyed playing it, and I think that's what matters. That's half the battle in a Sonic game. And what's funny is as I've gone on my Sonic pilgrimage, for those who don't know and haven't watched me before, I did not like Sonic at all. I hated his games because I played games like Sonic Forces and went, bleh, this is vomit on my screen. What am I playing? It's made for children now. This is this is not the generations that I fell in love with. Little did I know that I needed to be educated. So I went in with an open mind and I played Sonic Adventure 1 and I was like, yeah, if I, you think I'm gonna like this? Wait, what happened to, what happened to Gamma? Wait, why do I, why is Knuckles all alone? Oh, I started to feel things. Things that I never thought I was capable of experiencing. And so Sonic Adventure 1 is my favorite Sonic game because it it signifies when I had that awakening. But at the same time, going back after playing so many different Sonic games for this channel, I've recognized that Sonic Adventure 1, for me at least, feels the best. Like I love how it controls. There's no modernized slip and slide that you see in the 360 games where I'm flying off stages, falling through the floor. The only thing I felt I fought with when it came to Sonic Adventure 1 now is the camera. And that's an age thing. Otherwise, it feels good to do some 3D platforming. Sonic speed feels controllable. And it feels good to play if you're like me, who's like okay at Sonic games. And I've watched the speed runs online when you're like really good at Sonic. It's super satisfying to watch. So you could go as fast or as technically slow as you want, but still feel good because each level was designed with this mindset of nothing more than five minutes, please, okay? Outside of Knuckles, sometimes that's a little out of your control, but even that, like the way you could find the Chaos Emeralds and the tracker and how it worked, I enjoyed compared to something like Sonic Adventure 2. So I already liked Sonic Adventure 1 when I left that experience, but then as the series progressed and I went and played those and then came back, I love Sonic Adventure 1. I appreciate everything it does from its story to its gameplay structure because you could play someone like Tails and feel like you're breaking the game and then go and play as Knuckles and then literally break things around the level to find emeralds and it was a little more fun to hunt things down and missions didn't overstay their welcome. So I really liked spending time with these characters in Sonic Adventure 1 outside of Big the Cat. But yeah, I adore that game and what I do also adore is Sonic Adventure 2 in a different way. This is a beautiful copy of the game black label and all battle to save the world or conquer it this is oh, i just I, I love this box art so much it's this box art here for sonic adventure 2 battle and then the original sonic adventure one on dreamcast i those are some of my all-time favorites but cracking this one open here another sick disc art where you see sonic and shadow and then we got a nice manual here this one is an improvement. Number one, it's fat, it's thick, and then what do we have here? Yep, they listened. They listened indeed. Look at that! That's what I'm talking about, Sega! Oh my god, look at that, Sega! There you go! There you go, Sega! That's what I'm talking about! Sorry, I'm pumping them up like they're here in the room, but this is a beautiful manual. It brings a little tear to my eye. Metal Sonic and the two-player battle characters mode, the Chow Walker, Dark Chow Walker. This game, man, this game is something special. The controls, starting the game, all these different combinations of characters, the rules you had to follow in the action stages. It was, again, a very deep video game. You see Gerald Robotnik with Maria, very important character indeed. Kart racing was in the game. Wow. I'm just blown away by this man. Look at look at the little wow. Take notes, future game developers. This is the manual you must look to if you want to create something that's on a whole other level. I could look at this for days. I'm I'm sorry. I'm holding up the whole video because I'm just chow karate, kart racing. Man, what a special game. Okay. That's what comes with a complete box copy of Sonic Adventure 2. Happy to take you all down memory lane with this one. So let's talk about this game. I actually feel Sonic Adventure 2 is kind of flawed. I, I love it as a story. I think Shadow is what really lifts that whole game up. And I, I, my God, do I love Shadow so much, man. They, they say all hell Shadow and I take it for real. But Shadow is really to me what made me fall head over heels in love with the Sonic storytelling capabilities that that series has because 
when you look at him at first, he's edgy, but he really balances out, I think, Sonic, where Sonic's a sarcastic dude, but he's he's a do-gooder, where Shadow's kind of out for himself, and that final sequence with Super Shadow and Super Sonic is just chef's kiss. But, you know, when I talk about Sonic Adventure 2, I find that I'm not talking about what other it's things I like or dislike, what most of the community focuses on and so I hope you at least find that valuable perspective like a lot of people immediately go the chow garden I'm like okay then anyway uh shadow <laughs> so I think the chow garden's cool I totally respect and understand the nostalgia of like nurturing the chows and spending a lot of time with them I, I absolutely get it just for me this system just doesn't click big time. It's not where I want to spend my time. I personally love rerunning the levels, hearing the amazing music. Not that y'all don't, but like that's where I'm at. Like the Chow stuff, I'm so happy it's there. I'd love to see it come back and, and, and be like revolutionized in a Sonic Adventure remake of some kind and make it like not this obscure farming process, but something that you can really, I mean, you can sink your teeth into it, but something that you can connect with deeper, like for someone such as myself. But the mini games that were attached to it were awesome. Watching your child's face off. It's a great component of the game, but it's all I ever hear about with Sonic Adventure 2. And meanwhile, I'm sitting there like, yo, the storytelling here is phenomenal. I mean, you have 10 stages for like Sonic and Shadow and they're just all so masterfully done. Perhaps my biggest critique though of Sonic Adventure 2 is number one, they changed the Knuckles tracker, which what were we thinking, Sega? What were we thinking on this? It, it worked so perfectly in this game why did we change the Chaos Emerald tracker from one to two to be significantly worse where in Sonic Adventure 1, you could go ahead and track down any Chaos Emerald at any point in level. Good, right? Well, in Sonic Adventure 2, it's you gotta find a specific one at a specific time because the game just wants to hold on to you forever. So Meteor Herd can end up being like a 30 minute level. There's this weird cavern that you have a bunch of obscure hallways and you can get lost in there until you finally find a Chaos Emerald. Like, just, I think I spent half the time in my first ever Sonic Adventure 2 playthrough as Knuckles. And it's because they just put way too many stages in the game at certain points. And I think it, sometimes less is more and Sonic Adventure 1 captured that. So I get why as a sequel they said, well, let's do more, right? It's gonna cost us less to make new assets. We have them all existing. We have all the systems up and running. Let's just make a big Sonic game. And so I totally respect it, but just that's where I started to not click with Sonic Adventure 2. I felt like they spent more time on these characters that were either less interesting to play as or didn't have a big point in the story when they could have just really gone all in on some great Sonic and Shadow levels and kept trimming the fat on the other parts of the game to use them as support pieces. But that's like a philosophy, if you will, like something I personally believe makes Sonic Adventure 1 work better than 2, but you may disagree and that's fine. Moving down the ladder here, Sonic Heroes Platinum Hits. I know, but it's the only copy I own, so I was like, am I really gonna rebuy it when I already own it? No. So it says on the back, join the team. You got Team Dark, Team Chaotix, Team Rose, and of course, Team Sonic front and center. Cracking it open here. I love how this is like a Windows background. <laughs> I think I said that the first time I played it, but Sonic Heroes is a game that I really like, and look at this, look at this step down. Black and white again, Sega, come, come on. So again, you're always gonna get the team introductions, the, the character introductions here as you go through the entire manual. Who's the mystery monster? Gee, I wonder. You have the basic controls here. They don't spend a ton of time on each character because most teams do play the same. You know, you have your power formation, your speed formation, and so on and so forth. Um, they have the story mode here. There's also a versus mode and the special stages with the Chaos Emeralds that you have to collect to get the final ending in the game. And yeah, that's the manual right there. And then the back is a strategy guide if you so desire. So, Sonic Heroes, one of my favorites because it brought me back to a specific time. I don't think I would have loved this growing up, but as a young adult, this one brought me back to a time I had completely forgotten, which was Oh my God, my hands are sweating because of this 3D platforming is so intense. It's such an unforgiving game. It feels like everyone's on a slip and slide and can fall off at any point in time, especially when you're playing as Knuckles. He's like, shit, rah, shit, rah, and you're just flying around levels. The amount of times I accidentally 
killed myself and I had to redo the whole level because I tried to engage in combat when I had to and went flying. I just, this game I love, but it made me want to pull my hair out. It's, it's fun to play. The stages are so creative, especially the opening one. I believe it's Emerald Coast. I absolutely love that one. I might be mixing up with Sonic Adventure 1, but I absolutely love the opening stage in Sonic Heroes. I think it's a complete blast. And they continue that into the seaside levels. And, and I think as you get deeper in the game, I appreciate it more and more. It's just that there are certain ones that are really tough. And of course, Team Dark being the toughest. Now, what's unfortunate about Sonic Heroes to me compared to Adventure 1 and 2 is now they, they pump the brakes on the story. Like you get one bit of storytelling, in my opinion, which is the end of Team Dark with Shadow. And then you get another smidge of storytelling at the end with Metal Sonic and Sonic the Hedgehog. And pretty much there's clear envy from Metal Sonic that he wants to be the real Sonic. And Sonic's kind of a, a meanie about it. But I, I, I mean, otherwise it, they just make this game pretty devoid of storytelling and they go all in on this team mechanic. And I like that, I kind of like the, the co-op action that it, it tries to support and everyone has a different role on the team. So for me, Sonic Heroes works as a gameplay framework. It just was really frustrating at times and they just made my hands way too clammy. But speaking of frustration, no, I'm just, I'm sad. Shadow the Hedgehog. I said it was my favorite character, right? So I played this for the first time. We have a full video up this week. Hero or villain, uncover the truth about Sonic's arch rival, Shadow the Hedgehog. Here we have what unfortunately fell apart in the middle of that last video, uh, the manual. Yes, literally check that out. <laughs> so this manual, nothing to go crazy about. You get a long prologue introduction here. You have some quick character bios, not as deep as what you saw in Sonic Adventure 1 or 2 or even Sonic Heroes to some extent. There's a lot of controls though here because Shadow had guns, he could light dash, he could do a dark spin dash. There are different powers that you could acquire through the gauge based off actions you commit to in the levels that you're exploring. There's vehicles that you can ride around on. There's a two player game mode here for split screen battle. The complete box copy for Shadow the Hedgehog le leaves a lot to be desired as someone who's a big Shadow fanboy. But this game, man, this game, man. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to love Shadow the Hedgehog more than anybody on planet Earth. I am 100% confident in saying that, but the, the actual mechanics here, like for example, branching storylines, multiple endings, Love this idea because it has cohesion with the actions you take in the stage. Did you collect all the Chaos Emeralds? Okay, like you're gonna go down the neutral path. Did you help Sonic? Did you help Black Doom? Okay, you're gonna go down the either hero route or the dark route. I love that. Who is your shadow? I mean, cool. I, I just love that agency. I think it fits really well, weirdly enough, in the Sonic universe. Like I wish they explored these ideas more. It's that, again, much like I said with Sonic Adventure 2, Less is more sometimes, and they definitely did too much here with the ways you had to replay the game endlessly to get all 10 endings to then unlock what is the continuation to the Sonic Adventure 2 story. Like No one really asked, in my opinion, in Sonic Heroes, hey, Shadow, uh, how'd you get back here? Didn't seem to be a big question. You get a big tease at the end of the dark story. And then Shadow picks up and some people are surprised to see him, some aren't. And so, you know, it, it feels like, is this picking up or not? But then you get to that ending sequence and you realize, oh, this is the true backstory of Shadow. And I know a lot of people critique the edgy nature of the game. I love the edgy nature of the game. I really think it's a, a completely fun time. But all in all, Shadow the Hedgehog plays terribly and the way you have to get all the endings feels terrible because some of these levels like when you have to kill the artificial chaos with Maria just make you want to lose your mind that level took me like 30 minutes to complete the first time because I missed one artificial chaos and I had to run through it over and over and over there he is and you finally take him out and at least you don't have to run somewhere else after you finish that mission it just ends right there but the amount of times you gotta run through it, it just is so frustrating. It really is because the game could have been truly great if they just, you know, number one, fine tune the stages. Cause I think Westopolis was fine. Like running through that was fine. It was quick, easy. There weren't a lot of places for enemies to hide, but then you get to like the cybernet stages. <laughs> it's like number one, the, the color palette here is so horrendously ugly. And then 
you're trying to find your way and the levels are so big that running through them again takes forever. It's just a game that did not need to be as big as it was. If it was a quick five hour game that was pretty much the dirge of Cerberus for Shadow, or I'm sorry, for Sonic, that would have been exactly what I think fans were, would be happy with. But instead we get this convoluted, bloated game that I think gets a really cringy label slapped on it because it, it, it all that's all people can talk about because that's mostly what they see. It's really hard to get to the end of Shadow the Hedgehog. It's extremely frustrating to play. So as much as I want to support my man, I got to keep it real and say Shadow the Hedgehog ain't it. What also ain't it, in my opinion, Sonic Chronicle, the Dark Brotherhood. Hey, the Golden Age of Bioware. Uh, yeah, that was happening when they made the Dark Brotherhood. So imagine my excitement finding that one out that while Bioware is making KOTOR, oh, Dragon Age Origins, oh, also Mass Effect, oh, and Jade Empire, they said, oh, let's make a Sonic RPG. Like, are you kidding me? In that era of Bioware with that talent? Oh, what do we have here? So it says, new role, new rules. It is a turn-based Sonic RPG. Doesn't that sound incredible? Didn't this happen last time when I did this? Here it is, yeah. So we last time we covered this game, I had The World Ends With You in here. I put it in here saying I would find a home for it. I guess I forgot when I got to my home. Anyway, the manual here is okay. You know, it's just more of the same. They, they have a format, that's for sure. They do the character bios in the beginning, how you start a new game. They walk you through the game screen, all of the HUD, the team select menu, because you're gonna build your party. The Chow Garden does play a factor here, what the attacks are and all the mini games you have to do, four set attacks, and then you're pretty much at the end here. And seeing the credits reminds me of the most heinous ending of all time that exists in this game. And here on the back, you see that Sega's promoting uh, when they were doing their Marvel push, which was uh, a pretty disturbing time for them indeed. So. Sonic the Dark Brotherhood, another game you throw in the pile of, wow, I wish I could love you. You have all the Maddie bells and whistles, but again, the design and the structure of the game completely falls apart. So when you start the game, it's like, okay, I can get behind this. I like the little mini games, but the damage output and balancing, like I can't say this enough about some RPGs that really focus on everything but damage balance, but that's not supposed to be like second fiddle. That's the number one thing you get right, because you could have all the graphics, all of the customization that you want, like this game does, where it does allow you to customize chows and equip them onto different characters and all these different buffs and pieces of equipment you can get. Like, it's awesome. It's a true RPG. That doesn't matter if the damage I'm dealing feels like nothing. If I'm fighting an enemy with 999 health and I only do one damage per attack, it's going to be a terrible game. It's going to be a terrible time no matter what else surrounds it. That's exactly what this game embodies. It just needed to be balanced properly. And that's what it, it, it is here. So eventually, if you don't kill the enemies because they're so spongy, they run away from you and you engage in this weird runaway mini game. It, it just all falls apart. There isn't any charm to the music because it's all heavily compressed. And honestly, in some cases, I have to be real poorly composed. And that's a shame because the framework here, I like, I feel like I'm saying that a lot these last couple of games, but I, I hope you understand that this is what it means to be a critical Sonic fan because, you know, you have all these different hero actions you can commit to in the world. So you can run around and have like Amy use her hammer and break some boxes and now you can access a new area and the game gets a Metroidvania-like theme to it because now you're re-exploring parts of the world. And the story does pick up, and I gotta spoil the game here. This is the one game I'm gonna bend my spoiler rule for, and I hope y'all don't mind, but when you get to the end of the game, you leave Eggman behind, which I thought was interesting because you're going to this whole other dimension. And the reason this is interesting is because Eggman was actually in your party. People thought he was dead. He came back, and it turns out like he's not the main villain of the game, which I like. I love the approach there. Like He's not the main villain. You come back, and Eggman has set up his whole empire. It's like, whoa, 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 wait, what, what has changed? How did all this happen so quickly? Obviously there was something changing within, you know, the dimensions and how time had passed. And so he shoots Sonic and Tails and everyone in the crew out of the sky. And you're like, okay, this is picking up, what's going on? The game ends and then they break the fourth wall over their dang knees. Like they just snap it like clean in half. It's actually one of the most insane, disgusting endings I've seen. So I gotta say that as much as I wanna love Sonic, the Dark Brotherhood as an RPG, the grindy nature of the game really hurts it. The number balancing for the game really does hurt it. The music isn't that great. And honestly, the way choices and dialogue work as an RPG fan, I found weird. Like Bioware has mastered the formula of 
You have a list of questions you ask, you click one and then it returns back to that menu until the conversation ends, right? And what eventually happens in this game is no matter what dialogue option you pick, you're like, wait, I want to ask that too. It still progresses the game. Just the way it's laid out is pretty sloppily done. Speaking of sloppily done, oh no, 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 no. Sonic 06, here you sit before me. Now I will throw out there, Sonic P06, not this, but a fan remake feels incredible and is one of the best Sonic games I have played, at least in its current sample format. I really do recommend you check it out because I am a Sonic 06 sympathizer. I actually like this game in this weird way. I, I Will I play it to complete? No. <laughs> I loved it growing up. That was the first game I got on my PS3. And as you can see here on the back, it says this time speed won't be enough with Sonic, Shadow, and Silver. And this was supposed to be Adventure 3, right? You can get that vibe immediately upon starting it up. Like the whole menu layout, everything about it says like, okay, this has that adventure vibe. So call me an adventure fanboy, I guess. But like, that's why I, I feel like I'm a Sonic 06 sympathizer. So cracking it open, you got this creepy looking Sonic here on the disc, the manual. Do I really need to go through the manual for this game? It's black and white. It goes over a lot of the major characters you play as being Silver, Shadow, and Sonic. And they have a supporting cast with Tails and Knuckles, these characters that'll appear in the middle of your level and that you can take control of instead of like Sonic Heroes where they're all there or Sonic Adventure 1 and 2 where you have to play them in different campaigns. They kind of try to make them intermingle, but that's a pretty quick look at the complete box copy of Sonic 06, a game that during the pandemic went up in value. I remember seeing this game for like 70 bucks and then went back down. It's why I always say the retro gaming market's terrible because people just, I want to charge this much for this game. It's rare, right? No one wants this game, so let's make it valuable. No. Anyway, Sonic 06, why do I, why do I simp for this game? You may be wondering. Um, you know, I think it's the music. It, it's really catchy for me. It creates a vibe for the game. I think it's broken nature. It just makes me want to, you know, love it a little bit more because it's like so horrendously broken where the optimist in me looks at it and says, what can we extract from this that is positive? And I think, you know, you see a lot of potential all throughout the game. And that's what it really is to me. The, the story is pretty weird in my opinion, but what I love about Sonic P06 is it highlights why I think Sonic 06 would have been a good game because when you have it playing properly and feeling good, that's when you recognize like, oh, if this played good, like we can say all we want about the weird, <laughs> weird uh, human and animal relationship we see building here. But otherwise, if it played well, we could have just focused on, like, hey, this is a good feeling Sonic game, which as I said with Adventure 1 is half the battle. So Sonic 06, if it felt good, some of these levels would have been great. These would have been some of the best stages in Sonic history. Again, going to Sonic P06, it's hard not to talk about this fan remake while we have Sonic 06 in existence at the same time, just because when you play that, you understand, oh, these stages would have been amazing. This game would have felt really good. It really had a lot of potential. And I was always a believer in Sonic 06, again, purely because of nostalgia. And I like the music and the vibe of the game. And some of it's like glitches and, and bugs were really funny. Like hearing Tails fall off the level constantly as you're running around the hub world. Like, I don't know. I always got a kick out of that growing up. But yeah, I just got to say Sonic 06 made me. Um, but yeah, I, I have to say Sonic P06 game saving grace for sure and it's definitely my uh look it's not this game i love it's that one over there and if you go try that you'll see what i mean i'm not crazy i swear so it's really hard to extract anything positive from this the, it's no use take this you know with the silver boss fight it's a. Uh, yeah you definitely want to pull out your hair when you're doing some of the snowboarding it's it, it's better left in the past, but what I will say is I would love to see Sega get really ballsy and make like a next gen update for it and say, hey, it plays terribly, but it runs well now. And I remember when Xbox is doing a lot of FPS boost for some of their 360 Sonic games, that game was one that a lot of folks were really clamoring for. I'd love to see Sega do it just because they're in such a good position now with Sonic. Why not? <laughs> Why not? All right, we're gonna do a two for one here because I feel like when you talk about one, you kind of talk about the other. Sonic Riders. So we have Riders 1 and then we have Zero Gravity. I went with the PS2 copy here because to my understanding when I researched online, Sonic Riders on uh, PS2 and on Wii are pretty much the same game. So let's start off with Sonic Riders 1 where it says, 
think you got what it takes try to keep up cracking open the box here we got a nice little manual with you guessed it black and white they actually dedicate a whole page to the story here which i find personally hilarious because it is a sonic racing game effectively uh, before the sonic kart racing days as you can see everyone's got a new outfit for the riders saga if you will storm the albatross you have jet the hawk in here look at him he's one of the front and center characters love jet the hawk i believe the same voice actor who did sonic did jet the hawk but someone can correct me on that so yeah there's not much to take away because it's a racing game the extreme gear air system and air pit are probably the most important focal points here and the air boost that you'll find throughout the stages some gimmicks you can do like trick zones the accelerators, right? That's a big one. And the barricades you want to avoid, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, as you can see on the back here, Shadow the Hedgehog promotion for PS2. <laughs> Stay away from that version, I warn you. And then we'll take a look real quickly at Sonic Riders, where it says shift into zero gravity with anti-gravity control, allowing access to new stunt track paths and ultimate speed boosts. I really love this game growing up. And here we have the manual again. It's, uh, again, it's, it's, ah, man. They just really follow the formula here for the Sonic franchise. Here's your character portraits. Here's your extras and starting the game. Here's your controls, right? Yep, boom, there they are. <laughs> At least you can say that the, the same team was likely behind all of this. There's different gear types that you can get. Uh, there's boards, skates, bikes, air rides, yachts, wheels. Uh, really, really cool game. And we have Golden Compass on the back here, which uh, Sega must have been down something horrendous with some of these games they were publishing. They're like, movies? Us? Sure. So, Sonic Riders and Sonic Riders Zero Gravity. I mean, these were some of the first Sonic games I loved, probably because they had nothing to do with the storytelling that I think burned me growing up. But more than anything, they're just fun to play. Like, Sonic is gaining momentum. I just remember that playing over and over and over. Or whoever you're playing as, like, Tails is gaining momentum. And finding all these little dash spots and going really fast and blazing through the competition. This was during the Maddie Racing phase. Like, I was playing uh, Splashdown on PS2. I, I loved Splashdown. I still own those copies. But I thought Splashdown was awesome. And then this felt like the Sonic Splashdown. So they were recognizable, cool looking characters, but they were doing the same thing. So I was all about it. The tricks you could do on certain jump pads. It was a lot of fun. And then Zero Gravity, allowing you know multiple routes so you could feel like you were cheating in some of the races. I just remember, I don't know if it was Sonic Riders 1 or Zero Gravity. There was this one sand level that had a, had a, a sand pit that kept swirling in the middle and you had to go around the edge. I just remember as a kid, that thing always swallowed me whole. Like I could just not, I could never avoid it. So that haunts me to this day, it would seem, but I love this game, the feel of it, the music. Uh, I know some people always critique Sonic Riders. Why does this game exist, bro? Sonic's the fastest thing on the planet. Why can't he just, why can't he just run in these races? Dude, stop, just spare us. You must be fun at parties, I'm sure. Just let it be, it's a cool game. That's all there is to it. All right, speaking of cool games, Sonic and the Secret Rings. So there was a time where they did a Sonic storybook series and this says, the land of mystery meets the legend of speed. Sonic races through the exotic world of the Arabian Nights to harness the awesome power of the Secret Rings before they fall into the hands of the evil genie, Arazor. This game has a ton of party games, by the way, which I always thought was really cool. These games here, Sonic and the Black Knight and Sonic Seeker of the Rings, I do wanna play for the channel individually, so I will keep it brief here because I have yet to fully dive into it. But this was the beginning of the storybook series. And I, I thought that it was a really cool idea for Sonic. I know he kind of doesn't fit and that was the, the vibe. Like that was to me what made it click was, oh, he doesn't really belong here. So it was inherently more interesting, but there was a ton of missions you could go through, a hundred of them, in fact. And there were some of them that were even like prehistoric. I mean, there were tons of environments that you could go to in this game. I liked its depth, but, you know, playing it, I just, the controls, 
the controls. Like, I don't know how the Wii was so popular at times. I really don't because it kind of brings me here to Sonic and the Black Knight. We can talk about this a little bit more. And I love this little tab here. I just, I think it adds something to it with the storybook series. The back says, the next chapter in Sonic storybook series following Sonic in the secret rings. Are you worthy? When the Black Knight begins terrorizing King Arthur's Camelot, Sonic and friends suit up in armor to save the Enchanted Kingdom. Armed with the legendary sword, Sonic discovers what it means to be a true knight. To me, this game was great, but it controls pretty bad. And I think of Sonic games with combat like Sonic Unleashed, which we're going to talk about next. And I think it works really well. It's just always coming down to, in this case, controls like just waving your Wiimote constantly. Just, ah, man, how did we love that growing up? I don't know. But for me, these games as a setting, were really cool. Like you can even see here on the back of the box art, like you see Knuckles with like two swords, you see Shadow holding his sword like backwards. I I love that type of stuff. So I think the idea of giving Sonic a sword is cool. It's why I think Shadow exists because I'm pretty sure Sega got a letter in the mail that fans were requesting give Sonic a gun. And uh, so they made Shadow the Hedgehog. <laughs> it's funny because he's like the, to me the coolest character in the story. But I imagine this was their response to give Sonic a sword. And so that's what this game did. And I think it, it worked kind of well for what it was. Uh, the game is just cool in general. It's fun to play. I really like it. And so I am excited to dive deeper into it uh, for a full video. But continuing on, Sonic Unleashed, what is considered nowadays the best modern Sonic game. Like apparently it doesn't get better than this because for a lot of people, this game indicated, and I'd say it's fair to say so, the end of an era. This was the last game that people thought that Sonic Team tried with, with, you know, open world elements and dedicated stages. Eventually, they sort of started to streamline things and autopilot things, although I will disagree with that when we get to our next game. But the back says, the difference is night and day. I love this box art here, man. It's really cool to me. I remember seeing it in Blockbuster a ton. Now, taking a look at the manual here. Let me guess, black and white, first thing we're gonna see is a character portrait, afterwards is gonna be the main menu, and then we're gonna see a character control scheme. Let's see if we're right here, okay, let's let's begin. So, da, 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 da. wait, controls first with a prologue, Sega, hold on. Oh, there's the characters, okay, and then there's the controls for the characters, it's just his characters, Sonic. <laughs> there's Sonic the Werehog as well. I believe this is the one that says that Eggman is actually a feminist or no you know what it was i forgot to point this out earlier let me break out sonic heroes it was this game that i i thought it was hilarious that they had this in here hold on where is it where is it where is eggman where is eggman come to me here we are okay just so you all know i'm not crazy as his name implies dr eggman is a doctor that looks like an egg as well as having a unfeasibly high iq of 300 Eggman is a romanticist, a feminist, and a self-professed gentleman. So I just wanted y'all to see that. I thought it was uh, unleashed for a second there, but no, it was Sonic Hero. So just in case you're wondering when Eggman became a feminist in the Sonic timeline, it was Heroes. But anyway, you got a pretty good look at some of the really text-filled nature of this Sonic game. I mean, lots and lots of paragraphs all throughout here. Like, it's such small font, too. You could, uh, this is what we call a good car read. When you're driving home after picking up the game, you got a good car read with a game chair of all game chairs here. Wow. Imagine getting this one for Christmas as a kid. I'm sure someone in the audience has, but anyway, that's Sonic Unleashed complete in box. Let's talk about this one. Okay, so this is where like the boost system is introduced and this is where Sonic starts to feel pretty good where you go to like Empire City and I love the feel of the Empire City stages, but there are other times that this game is too fast for its own good and you just, you wanna talk about Sonic on a slip and slide. This to me is that game where I'm just flying all over the place and I can't feel like I'm truly in control. Now I feel like it's Sonic Generations that truly mastered it, but to me, Sonic Unleashed was the beginning of something great, but half the battle of Sonic is a feel. And I, I really don't feel great in this game because you're either flying off of levels in the speed boost levels, 
or you're going to the combat section with the Werehog, which the combat's actually fine. Like it's kind of DMC reminiscent in some ways. There's tons of combos, there's upgrading in the game, skill points you can invest in. Like it kind of has RPG elements. That stuff is cool. But my big issue here is number one, that you cut out some of the most vibey music in all of Sonic's history, by the way, just to hear the da 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 Like, oh my God, this, this battle music will haunt me to my grave. It's, it's terrible. It's terrible. <laughs> and they cut off some of the most vibing tracks because of it. I can't believe it. But it just, these levels go on too long. Like, again, Sonic is a series that I think needs to understand, don't overstay your welcome. Don't go too long. We, I don't mind the occasionally long stage. Like, some people didn't like Eggman Land. And personally, I don't mind Eggman Land. I, I like that it was a, combina a culmination of all the things you learned throughout the game. And I feel like it was well-designed, so it wasn't that bad. But then there's this, you know, weird boss fight at the end. It's so long winded and you fight with the camera. I just feel like Sonic needs to learn how to scale down just a little bit, just a tighter game. Again, Sonic Adventure 1 is right there as a framework. We can take that, evolve the hub world and have something truly special. But Sonic Unleashed was the last time they really tried with an emotional story. I do think part of the ending does tug the heartstrings a little bit. I loved going to different parts of the world. I thought that was really cool to see the actual world of Sonic, even if some of the NPCs look absolutely hilarious. I still thought it was really cool what they did here. But let's continue on talking about my personal favorite modern Sonic game. And I need a new complete box copy because this has a rip here and that bothers me. Sonic Generations, playable in 3D. The back says two Sonics, two ways to play. Here we go. Now, Sega, I critiqued them a lot, and this is where they said, all right, we're throwing the towel. So we have the controls on one page, Xbox Live settings for leaderboard stuff, and then controls in another language, and then a Sonic Sega All-Stars racing game with Banjo-Kazooie. Actually, didn't know that, but really quick manual there. Okay, Maddie, this is your favorite Sonic game for the modern era. Why is that? It has nothing to do with the story. Let me tell you that right off the rip. Nothing to do with this story at all. Sonic Generations just feels amazing to play. And nowadays with the Xbox Series X getting FPS boost, you owe it to yourself to give this game a whirl and play levels that typically were bogged down by bad frame rate. Okay, like Speed Highway is one of my all time favorite Sonic levels. Cause what I love about Generations and especially now in hindsight is as I go through all these Sonic games, I see all these stages, I pick my favorites, and suddenly I find some of them are here in Generations, and they tackle them in different ways. You get the classic 2D Sonic, you also get the speedy 3D Sonic, but they evolve the boost system where you could hold the right trigger, and it would let you sort of burn out and hit corners a little tighter, and that was what the... Oh my God, did Unleash need that so bad? I would love to see a retooling, a remaster of Unleash that adds just that mechanic to the game because it would have helped it so much. But Sonic Generations has this mechanic built into the game. So going at high speeds feels controllable, right? Because Sonic is always obsessed with going as fast as possible. And if you're going down a straight pathway, I guess, sure, if you're gonna do that like in Sonic Forces, why not? But when you're hitting curves and turns, if you don't have a proper way of really hitting the brakes and burning out, like Sonic Generations to me in 3D felt like a, a, a good burnout game. And I think that's the best compliment you can give Sonic when he's going fast. It felt like an arcadey racing game. And you could find shortcuts just like some of the best Sonic games ever. I think this game feels so good. The problem is the story obviously isn't good. And I think I'm just willing to accept that because so much of it does feel great. So I'm, I'm, I'm giving it the concessionary award as best modern Sonic game. Continuing on, let's take another look at a Sonic game that I know many people don't remember fondly. Sonic Lost World. We got the 3DS version here. Apparently, I, I did not know this when I ordered it, but uh, this is a worse version of an already pretty bad game. But I don't know, I was interested from the outside looking in, and I'll get into why, but first the back of the box says, Rise Against the Deadly Six. When a new enemy threatens to destroy his world, only Sonic's new moves and color powers can stop them before it's too late with new moves, powers, and worlds. Inside, yes indeed, there is a manual alongside the Club Nintendo slip here. Remember those? Man, those are great. Never used them, but cool to see. The manual here, you guessed it, 
it's a one pager and it's over with the warranty here on the back and that's it. So nothing to go crazy about with the complete inbox experience, but what I will say as someone who hasn't played Sonic Lost World and will naively step into it one day for this channel, for all of you, I like the idea of Mario Galaxy, but Sonic, because that's what I saw when watching reviews of this game. I, I saw, oh, there's sometimes planets that you have this almost outward view of and you're walking around them and gravity's just doing its thing. I love that type of stuff because while I wasn't in love with Mario Galaxy, I think Sonic's a more interesting franchise to play. And so to see them take some ideas from there, sure, they're shamelessly ripped off, but so was 95% of things made in video games. So I'm fine with it, but it looked like it was cycling out mini games. It's just that some of the combat looked a little wonky. And obviously we're starting to see now the decline of Sonic storytelling. You'll notice as we go here into the deep part of the video, I'm gonna say that a lot, like, oh, I didn't really play this one yet. Keep in mind, I'm still on my Sonic pilgrimage. I've been making up for lost time playing some of the older games, and I did bail out of the modern franchise outside of Generations. I did get back into it with Unleashed, but like I said, it's just been one of those series where I hated it, I came back, oh, I love these older games, and I'm gonna start to probably hate it again as I get into the newer stuff, but Speaking of hating, I'm sure y'all can relate to this one. Sonic Boom, Rise of Lyric. Can you blame me when I said that I just stopped playing this series? I mean, I remember when this game came out. It was like the world had set ablaze. Rise of Lyric was terrible. Not to be confused with Sonic Boom, Fire and Ice, which some people did say was a good bounce back. Again, I'm checked out. I watched him from afar going, <laughs> there goes Sonic Team again doing their thing. So we have a, a my only Wii U game, by the way, my only Wii U game. I, uh, I'm i slightly disappointed in myself. Four friends must face an ancient evil in an all new adventure. Sonic and his friends must work together to stop the evil alliance of Lyric and Dr. Eggman. Each with their own unique abilities, the team must explore, fight, and speed through an undiscovered land to save the world. And uh, yeah, you know, again, idea is here for sure. We'll look at the manual. I can't believe this game cost me 30 bucks. I mean, oh, the pain, the pain. Look, I, I paid $30 just to get a manual that literally just says character abilities. It's all text. There's, they even dropped at this point. You knew it was a dud when they dropped the Sonic manual formula, right? None of the character portraits, none of the story stuff. It's just, man, I guess that speaks to the Wii U. But yeah, this is during the Sonic Boom era where very, very kid friendly, as we can see with the toys in the back. But... You know, it's funny when I when I speak to younger kids because um, my my parents work at a school. I you know I'll ask about Sonic and oh they love Sonic and I'm just like, <laughs> you kids need to be enlightened ASAP. So Sonic Boom Rise of Lyric. There's me. I'm in the bleachers pretty much just watching the chaos unfold in the Coliseum of game reviews and yeah Sonic Boom Rise of Lyric looks pretty bad. It looks almost like. There was a lot of the framework that we'd come to see in Sonic Forces put into this game. The way you explore the levels, the way it was very autopiloted. I just feel like the thoughtfulness, the writing, they just stopped caring during this stretch. It's why I'm very interested in Sonic Frontiers because I feel like at least from the outside looking in, it seems like they care more with this entry. And of course we can be wrong. We've seen how these modern Sonic games have gone. But with Sonic Boom Rise of Lyric, I mean, this game, that will be a fun video to make because I already am going in with a pretty heavy bias of, oh, this looks terrible. So it certainly is. That is for sure. I mean, you just watch some of the gameplay, the, the team roles and how everyone gets around. It's very clear that this was stitched together and there wasn't a lot of thought on the design and that's very frustrating. But one we can celebrate here, and this is one I know I gotta get off my list, but I'm not crazy about 2D Sonic games, but what we have here is in a shiny little sleeve, Sonic Mania Plus. And the reason I wanted this Plus version is, check that out, the art of Sonic Mania comes with it. And I love this, right? You know me, I love little art books like this. So beautiful. You know, the, the, say what you will about Sonic, I always think it's enemy design, it's character design stage design is pretty inspired here like this is a new these are two new characters to me mighty the armadillo and ray the flying squirrel i 
I, I, I apologize for my ignorance here. I, I, I appear I'm in over my head, but I, I just, I love this art book here. And actually they tell a little bit of a story in the front of it that I think is worth reading to sort of set up talking about this game. It says, by the mania for the mania. In 2016, a team of passionate developers pitched an idea for a new 2D game to Sega. Having grown up inspired by Sonic games, the idea of working on an official project seemed like an impossible dream until now. The idea expanded and evolved under the guidance of Sonic Team and grew from a small project into a major initiative involving teams across the globe. The next year, Sonic Mania released to rave reviews and universal praise from critics and fans alike and became the highest reviewed Sonic game in 15 years. But there was one thing still wanted, a physical edition all their own, because this was digital at first. Now it's finally time. This collector's art book that you're holding is exclusive to the physical plus version of the game and it's a special gift to you. It features a look at the creative sketches, early designs, and some of the never before seen concepts that went into Sonic Mania. We hope you enjoyed as much as we enjoyed putting it all together. From start to finish, this project has been by the Mania for the Mania. So really cool story about this. Yeah, it's not Team Sonic. That was a bit of a black eye for Sega when they uh, let this go because it benefited them. They got an amazing Sonic game, but they also had their own team kind of suffer for it. So the back of the box says the ultimate celebration of past and future an all new Sonic adventure with Sonic, Tails, Knuckles, full of unique bosses, rolling 2D landscapes and fun pixel perfect gameplay. Five playable characters with unique abilities, vibrant new stages and classic zones and join a friend in co-op or four player competition mode. Here you crack it open, you just have some Sega merch promoting here. I love this little picture. Um, that one's cool. I, I would actually wear that probably. But otherwise, the the weird Xbox One case strikes again. I'm very keen on trying this game again. When it came out, I did buy it because you know me. I'm sitting there in the bleachers. I'm watching my franchise burn from afar. And then I see these amazing reviews pop out. And so I try it out, and it's 2D. And I'm not being an elitist here. Just I prefer Sonic in the 3D. But what awoken that 2D side of me that went, okay, this can be good, was Sonic Generations, which I don't know if that's a good standard or not. Sonic Origins has been a fun little experiment to go through as of lately, too. I mean, there's so many games clearly I got to catch up on. And I'm sure the, com the comments will definitely let me know uh, where I should begin here as I catch up on more modern games. But with Sonic Mania Plus, I remember loving some of the stage music, but exploring the stages in 2D, I just I love when there's 3D and there's that... It feels like it fits Sonic better, but I'm not gonna judge this one until I really lay my hands on it. I'm just giving my impressions from the outside, but this was a magnificent game for many Sonic fans, one they've been waiting for for a while. It felt like a good shot in the arm for the franchise that it desperately needed. And soon after, we'd get Sonic Team stepping into the mix with Sonic Forces. Oh man, so we do have a video on this channel uh, giving the game a second chance this year. It was a couple months ago, I did it over the summer. Join the uprising. The evil Dr. Eggman is taking control of the world. Now you must defeat iconic old villains and fight a powerful new enemy to reclaim the world in this epic new adventure. Inside you have the biggest insult to me personally, which is Sonic Forces Shadow DLC. It's three levels you play a shadow to tell the backstory of Infinite, which is hilarious how bad it is. But we love Shadow, so we support, we played it. Um, this game, here, hi, hello. Um, not sure what we were thinking, but um, I don't think you require a brain to play this game. And I'm saying that in all seriousness. This is one of the most autopiloted video games I've experienced. Like it's pretty much the equivalent of sitting down for a four to five hour movie. You may as well go watch Lord of the Rings, right? It's a passive experience, right? It's just all happening. You're not pressing any buttons. It's just going for you. Think of a lot of the levels in Sonic Forces like that. You're just flying by as you hit another dash pad and another bunch of rainbow rings and they're zipping you along a, a bunch of rings after that that you're pressing one button for. The, all the pathways are straight. You can't slide off the stage. There's no real controls to make sure that you are in control. Remember when I talked about where Sonic Generations almost felt like a really good burnout game to me? That's not what you get here or anything close to it. The game takes you around the curves itself. It was built for, I wouldn't even say toddlers. Like I could hand this for to a two year old baby and they'd be able to get through the game. And that's not even accounting for the story here where they did have something with infinite and they throw it all away at the end. They did have something here and they just leave them completely unresolved. 
kill him off, and that's it. It's just such a, a black eye on the franchise here. This game is the last modern one we really got. We do have one last game to go through, which is a remaster, but this is the last modern one we got until now, Sonic Frontier. So we're hoping it's a real bounce back effort. What I can say from the outside looking in is at least Sonic Frontiers does look fresh. And I'm saying outside looking in a lot today, but I mean, look, we're, we're, we're all, we're all spectators right now, right? So that's the best I can do with my, my vocabulary. But Sonic Forces has the weirdest character creator of all time. It actually makes me uncomfortable looking at it as you make some real specimens in this lab. I mean, the, the shooed in, really not even shoot in, the phoned in online connectivity and random missions. You know, I like the idea of there being a war, but it, it just felt like it was so easily resolved. There was so much room to expand and make one of those kind of Sonic Unleashed 10 hour experiences, but it's half of that and just way too short. And I do think some Sonic games start to air on the bloated side, but Sonic Forces is a rare time I go, a little bit more story here could have gone a long way for the autopiloted gameplay, but it's just such a, disengaging experience truly so avoid at all costs just watch my video call it a day <laughs> last game sonic colors ultimate just came out last year now sonic colors has been out for a while but the ultimate remaster is a story unto itself it was completely broken and people were playing it on emulators instead because it looked worse it ran worse there was clearly a, a notion here that this had been rushed out the door the back says color the universe joins sonic in the high speed intergalactic adventure of a lifetime experience non-stop action at sonic speed use powerful wisps to harness unique abilities and better than ever with stunning visuals. That last part is pretty funny. Inside, you have the ultimate icon pack, and then you have the disc, and that's pretty much it. So, Sonic Colors. This game looks awesome. It's here in the collection, ready to be played. Gameplay-wise, it looks awesome. But my god, the writing I've seen for this game. Oh, oh my gosh. No, 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 no. Baldy McNose hair. I know that's like a really popular line in the franchise, but even before that scene, as I watched build up to the Baldy McNose hair moment, I was in awe at when you go from what we just did earlier this week with Sonic Adventure 1, right? You go from that game where I wouldn't say it's phenomenal writing, but very simple, very to the point. You see how it evolves in Sonic Adventure 2 the heartfelt moments, the emotion in both those games. And again, I'm not going to claim it's perfect, but you see the effort in the writing team. And then you hear Baldy McNosehair as, as a, a name for a boss. Like, dude, where is the creativity? Where did it go? And that's the probably most frustrating thing is it's so easy to forget, much like Star Wars nowadays. Like Star Wars, every story, I haven't watched Andor yet, but every story it feels is about the light side or coming to the light side. And I get it, there's so much oppressive, dark material out there, but it feels like Sonic went that route of, oh, this is a sarcastic hero, right? Let's just make him a really good guy. Let's make everyone around him lighthearted and funny, just like him. And it, it, the whole series lost its identity, and you can argue the same way for some modern Star Wars content has helped lost its identity. It may be a weird correlation to some, but to me, I feel like there are some similarities in the tone that this series, Sonic, as well as Star Wars, approach themselves with, which is just there's no ambition to do something different. I don't know if that's because of corporate overhead or whatnot, but it's frustrating. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, that is our biggest remembering yet, our biggest retrospective yet. It is a seismic pile of Sonic video games here that we have, and wow. If you got this far in the video, uh, first of all, thank you. That is incredible, and I'm honored that you could tolerate me for that long, but I do hope you enjoyed. And I know a lot of these games I have yet to play, so if you did enjoy this and you're looking for more Sonic content, please do stick around. We do play a Sonic game pretty much monthly. We took a little break in September and October, but we typically have a Sonic game a month, so it's definitely something pretty frequent on the channel. But that's all. You've heard enough from me. I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts on what your favorite Sonic game is, what you're really looking forward to diving into, how you're feeling about Frontiers, all that good stuff. Please do fire away. And with that, take excellent care of yourselves, and I will see you in the next Retro Rebound. Peace out.